Herkese merhabalar. Hepiniz tek Hello everyone. Welcome again. Uh, this uh, panel is called well combating hate speech and disinformation against social polarization and the project is called U utilizing digital technology for social cohesion positive messaging and peace by boosting collaboration exchange and solidarity so we will define several concepts uh, without further ado i'd like the le to leave the floor to handan for the moderation welcome again Şimdi açtım. Okay. Perfect. Um, so uh, again, thank you everyone for uh, being here and thank you to Granting Foundation uh, for inviting us. So uh, starting with our speakers, we have Alex Mahadevan in here. Um, so Alex is the director of Media Vice at the Pointer Institute. Um, since 2019, he's taught digital media literacy to thousands of teenagers and older adults and train journalists across the world in verification and digital tools for investigations. He also co-leads the Empowering Digital Diverse Digital Citizens Lab with Stanford University researchers. So, hi, Alex. Um, we have also uh, Stephanie Ullman in here. Um, Stephanie is a postdoctoral research associate at the CRASH project at Cambridge University. Um, her most recent work fo uh, has focused on quarantining online hate speech, misinformation, gender bias and machine translation, dynamic data statements, and exploring counter speech approaches uh, to fighting hate speech. So um, hello again, Stephanie. And we also have Kareem Dervish in here. Uh, Dr. Kareem Dervish is a principal scientist at AI Explain Inc. working on efficient human in the loop, ML and speech processing. Previously, he was the acting research director of the Arabic Language Technologies Group, ALT. Uh, at the Qatar Computing Research Institute, where he worked on information retrieval, computational social science, and natural language processing. So we have quite, quite a speaker crowd in here, and thank you again to all of you uh, for being here. Uh, without further ado, I would like to kick off um, and start the presentation with Dr. Kareem Dervish. So, um, yeah. Merhaba. How's everyone doing? Um, good. So uh, my uh, name is Kareem Derwish. I'm a principal scientist as, at Explain, and I'm going to be talking about quantifying uh, polarization on social media, particularly on Twitter. Uh, so before I start, let me tell you about where I work. So I work at a company called Explain that helps people build the machine learning models. So we help them uh, as far as benchmarking, human in the loop and deployment. So if you're interested in building AI applications, please visit explain.com. As far as my work is concerned, I work uh, a lot on speech processing and natural language processing and uh, computational social science. And the talk today is going to be more related to computational social science. Aside from uh, the uh, you know technical stuff, uh, this is my personal stuff now. Uh, I have a YouTube channel with, uh, I mean, I think I have around uh, 11,000 followers now. And I like uh, photography. Uh, I have a few books for pop science uh, books. And also I like calligraphy quite a bit. So without further, you know, more, I mean, let's just delve right into the topic. So the topic today is about polarization. And when we raise this issue of polarization, it's like, who cares, right? Why should we care about this? And it turns out that polarization leads to many societal ills. So uh, after the uh, coup that happened in Egypt in 2013, 
uh, there was, you know, this, uh, this is a, one of the pop singers came out and he said, you are one people and we are another people, right? And, and, uh, and the in increased polarization society led to the death of thousands of people uh, in a really unfortunate way. And the more glaring example is the example of, uh, of the Rwandan genocide back in the 1990s, where basically before the, months before the genocide, the, uh, there was lots of uh, pumping of negative information or hateful information against you know, uh, the Tutsis spe specifically that led to the death of about half a million people over a span of a few months. So uh, the fact of the matter is polarization and the ramifications of polarization in the sense of uh, hate speech and the spread of fake news against the other party that increases the hatred in society actually leads to death, right? So this is very, very, very serious, okay? So if we want to quantify this polarization, and then when we say quantify you know, polarization, we want to see whether society is becoming uh, more homogenous and people are talking with each other or becoming more polarized and they're going to stop talking to each other, there are two core technologies that I'm going to address today. The first one is called stance detection, and I'll explain what this is. And the other one is the actual quantification, meaning uh, in-group versus out-group bias. Okay. So the manifestations of this polarization is that people who, are, who hold similar views to each other tend to delve or, or, or live in closed circles. Uh, they call them on social media, they call them echo chambers. Like everybody is as if that you're talking and then you're hustling to yourself back again after you've heard yourself, right? So everything that you say and the people around you are saying is socially conforming to the norm of that group, right? Uh, and the people from outside this group, outside of your group or the opposing group, uh, there's general mistrust of the other side. There is emotional and mental and sometimes physical separation where you would find that certain neighborhoods would have people of a certain type of uh, persuasion and then the other neighborhoods are of a different kind of persuasion and on social media having these echo chambers but or, or, or like i'm sorry the separation is even much easier than having them in real life even though we see this manifestation in real life and uh, if you if you're interested in this you know uh, physical separation, you should, there's a book called the, the Big Sort about how certain neighborhoods in the U.S. are becoming more liberal or becoming more conservative. And this separation leads to uh, hatred and potential violence uh, down the stream. Okay? So we'll talk about two technologies again. The first one is stance detection and the other one is the actual quantification of polarization. So let's take what stance detection is. So uh, I'm sorry that you know the, the, the tweets are, are in English. So you know for the uh, for the Turkish colleagues, uh, you know, cannot, I'm, I'm 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 sorry. So so if you look at these two tweets, they're actually talking about two different topics. One of them is gun control, and the other one is related to Ilhan Omar, who's a representative in the in the U.S. Congress, right? And if you look at both tweets, you can see that there are people. There's on the first tweet here on the first one, uh, it says uh, it passed meaning gun control, the Democrats are coming for your, own, for your guns, right? So these are people who are against gun control. And the other part is that is, is for gun control because so many people get killed every year because of gun control. And the same thing you can see for the case of Ilhan Omar. So what is stance detection? So stance is your position towards a particular entity or a particular topic or something, like, like, if, like your position or how you feel towards something, right? And stance detection is just the automation of finding this, uh, this, uh, this stance in a, in, a, in a programmatic way that you can actually have not just one person that you can actually detect their stance on a topic, but you can have uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or maybe millions of people that you can determine where, how they feel about a particular topic. And some of the popular things, I mean, like, uh, uh, in like in, I'll give some US examples here, uh, you know, the people who are uh, uh, pro-life or pro-choice, People during the last Turkish election, there were two popular hashtags, uh, you know, Tamam and Davam, so they're both against each other. 
and the list goes on and on. Even things that were people who like uh, Apple, you know, iPhones and those who like uh, Samsung uh, Android phones. So, so sense detection is live and kicking across the board, right? Okay. So how do we uh, do sense detection? So there are multiple methods, and the most popular and the most, you know, actually the most sensible thing that we people started with was uh, supervised learning, where basically if you can see the the classes here that we have on the screen. So uh, the first class, somebody who is uh, is talking and supports, you know, the 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 uh, the, uh, the the Russian operation in Ukraine, and the way you talk about it, it's a, it's a limited, you know, operation, military, you know, operation, and it's ending the unipolar world and so forth. And the other side is saying, you know, it's a, it's a, the Russian invasion and Russia is being humiliated and so forth. And notice in the words that I'm listing here in the examples. They are not necessarily sentiment words because there's nothing to, I mean, there's no relationship between sentiment. Sentiment is how you feel internally, but uh, your position could be expressed in many, many different ways. It could be as simple as saying invasion versus military operation, right? So they're just, they're just explaining or talking about the same event using two different words. And basically what you would do is that you given positive examples or examples of, of one stance and the examples of another stance, you build a, some sort of a text classifier, you train a text classifier and you build the model. And then when you get new examples, you can actually run the model against them and figure out that one of them belongs to class A and the other one belongs to class B. And there are many, many different ways to do this. So you can use uh, support vector machines on words. You can also use transformer models uh, like uh, BERT and so forth. And you can use a variety of different features like uh, which words people use, which hashtags people uh, use also, uh, who they retweet on, on, uh, on social media, which media they listen to and so forth. So all of these things actually correlate very well with people's stances. And the funny part about stance detection, it actually goes beyond what people say about a particular topic. So for example, people's stances affect, or actually it does not affect, but correlates with other life, life choices. Like, you know, what they eat, what they drink, where they go and so forth. And if you've ever, if you're interested in this topic, there's a big topic in, in research called lifestyle politics. And one of the popular papers there is why do liberals drink lattes? There's no relationship between lattes and liberalism, but you know, there is there is a correlation, right? There's a it's, it's not a causal relationship, but it's it's just a correlation. Okay, it's funny, but but true. Okay, so these methods are up to ninety percent accurate, right? And uh, and this is where the cap is. It's very very hard to go beyond ninety percent. Uh, you can use also semi-supervised learning, where basically something like label propagation, you start out with users that you have the labels for, and then you see users who uh, share similar content. And as they share similar content, you can recognize, oh, um, uh, me and Alex are, sh are generally sharing from the same sources. That's you know, likely that you know, we're going to have you know, similar views on not just one topic, but across multiple topics, right? Because many topics correlate with each other. The uh, semi-supervised methods are quite accurate. Generally, they can give you results above 95%, but the recall is low. And the third method that I'm going to talk about is, is, uh, is a completely unsupervised method where basically we're using clustering to, to actually put people uh, of different views with each other without any training data at all, right? And the trick here is that we use some sort of dimensionality reduction and once we do that, because the clustering, you know, in very high dimensional spaces uh, doesn't work. Uh, but when you do dimensionality reduction, suddenly, you know, uh, clustering works and we can get fairly good uh, results. And just the trick is that we need to represent the user somehow. So we can, we can, uh, we can um, uh, represent them using the hashtags that they use. We can represent them using the text that they use. Uh, we can represent some using the accounts that they retweet. And it turns out the accounts they retweet are actually more important than what they actually say, right? Uh, and this is actually an example of, of one of the papers that, uh, that uh, I published with colleagues a few years back about you know, political polarization here in Turkey. And as you can see, you can actually separate automatically between uh, JHP supporters, uh, AK Party or AKP, depending on how which persuasion you are, right? And the HDP and so forth, and you can actually automatically separate the the, the, the supporters of every uh, party in a completely unsupervised way. 
which is from a technological standpoint great, but pretty scary. <laughs> from a, okay. Let's move on to the next topic. And uh, so the next topic is now that we know how to do, uh, you know, sense detection, and we can separate people. We can say these people feel, have this position and these other people have the opp opposing position. Now let's talk about quantification. And quantification, people might be different, right? They might actually have different stances, but they might be talking to each other, right? Uh, for example, you can have, I mean, one of the popular examples of, uh, of, of this kind of thing is if you, if you, if you are in Kenya, the you know the likelihood that people across uh, you know tribal lines talk to each other and cooperate is actually very very low and then uh, you cross the border i think into uh, uh, like uh, tanzania which is like right south of it people are from different tribes but they cooperate with each other so the polarization in tanzania is much much lower compared to kenya even though the separating lines are the same but the way that people deal with them is different so what we're trying to measure here is whether people are actually communicating with each other. And when they communicate with each other, that means they're listening to similar sources and they're speaking similar language. Okay? They would, they would call this, you know, things this, with using the same words. If they stop calling things with the, using the same words or they stop listening to the same sources, the greater the separation, the more polarization. And as I told you in the beginning, the more polarization, the higher the propensity for mistrust, hatred, and potential violence, and things that would come down the stream like hate speech and fake news and so forth. Okay. So uh, again, so when we're trying to measure polarization, we want to see what is common between the two groups. So if we have these two groups together like this, if, if they are using similar speech, there's lots of overlap in the speech. And then if they're not, and they're just using just completely different words, the more they separated they become. And as I told you, the separation can be seen in the hashtags that people use or the sources that people cite uh, on, on the internet, whether there's there, there are other social media accounts and, or, or, uh, or news sources. Okay. Multiple methods to do this. I'll just skip this one. The most, one of the, the more stable ones is, is something called random walk controversy, where basically you, you are, after you separate groups into group A and group B, what's the likelihood you can jump from where you are to one of the central nodes and the people who agree with you. And if, you, if there's a likelihood that you'd actually jump to somebody, you know, to in the other group, the more likely, I mean, if the, the increased likelihood that you'd actually jump to, the, the, to somebody in the other group, the less polarization. And as, as polarization increases, you know, the likelihood that you'd actually jump and listen to somebody else in the other group diminishes. Okay. So, uh, one paper that I, we, I published a few years back uh, was about the, the Kavanaugh uh, nomination. He was nominated to the Supreme Court. And uh, we actually looked at polarization levels. And we were interested, you know, how high, we, high they were. And I just want you to look at these numbers. And these numbers kind of look scary. So, so the likelihood that they're using similar hashtags or they're not using this, the same hashtags was upwards of like 88%. So they had only 12% in common. And the likelihood that they would actually listen to each other, listening to sources, like if you're on the right and you're listening for somebody on the left, or you're on the left and listening to somebody on the right, it's actually less than 4%. And that's very unhealthy, right? When a society gets to that point, I mean, alarm bells should, should ring. Unfortunately, they're not ringing in some countries high enough. <laughs> okay. okay, and and we actually looked at the hashtags that they were using, and you know the like you know like uh, the popular hashtags or the popular sources on both sides. And as you can see, normally you would I mean if, if things were all all right, you would see a bell curve, but you're actually seeing a U curve, which is really horrid. Okay, so. So, as I said earlier, offensiveness and sentiment, okay, let me just skip the slide because of time. So, in conclusion, I mean, if you want to work on, on, on polarization, you need to do two, two things. One, you need to automatically identify the different groups or the different poles that you have. And then the next thing is you want to measure how likely people are talking to each other or not talking to each other. And that's where it becomes important to actually measure polarization. So 
you you be I mean like I'll just give an example to like I was we at some point in time I was working with the UN in one of the countries one of the African countries and they were actually interested in measuring uh, the likelihood of violence because of upcoming elections so and and it turns out that you can actually measure whether violence might actually happen 10 to 14 days before it happens by just measuring polarization and that's a wrap thank you so much Um, thank you so much for this presentation. It's really, I think, scary to see how polarization demonstrates itself in data. We're going to move on um, with Stephanie. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Okay. This is better. Um, I just click on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, the next one. Yeah. Here we go. Um, Yes, uh, hello from me as well, and uh, thank you so much for, for inviting me and for having me here. Um, yes, I'm gonna, it's, it's not gonna get much more fun, I'm afraid, so <laughs> I'm gonna focus on um, a little bit more on hate speech in my talk, and specifically um, on counter speech and using counter speech to uh, fight online hate speech, both in the form of human counter speakers and also automated systems. Um, yes, uh, a brief overview of my talk. Um, I will start by talking a little bit about the problem of, of online hate speech. I'm not going to focus so much on misinformation because we're going to hear from, from Alex um, about this. Um, I'm then going to move on to counter speech. What is counter speech? What are the different uh, types of counter speech? Um, and also, what are the effects of counter speech? I'm going to look at some, some studies that have been published. Um, then I'm going to focus in the final bit of my presentation on attempts at automating counter speech and um, maybe also the suggestion of a semi-automated form of counter speech or a human in the loop approach. So um, I think, okay, yeah, <laughs> I feel like it, it stops sometimes, but it's okay. Um, yeah, I think this is probably no surprise to any anyone um, that online hate speech and misinformation is one of the biggest threats uh, to democracy and, and peace that we are facing at the moment. Um, and I want to read out this quote by the Center for Countering Digital Hate, which says that digital spaces forming an important new plane of human existence have been colonized and their unique dynamics exploited by fringe movements that instrumentalize hate and misinformation these movements are opportunistic, agile, and confident in exerting influence and persuading people. So just looking at a few numbers here from mostly the UK and also the US, um, according to a study that was done in 2019, um, up to 40% of people in the UK have witnessed harmful content and up to 20% say that they've experienced it themselves online and this was before the pandemic so it's very likely that numbers um, are much higher today um, and there are also um, many studies now that show that there is actually a concrete effect an offline effect of, of hate speech on the internet um, it can it is directly linked to violence in real life um, and it is very likely to have very traumatic psychological consequences for victims, um, especially in the US and the UK, but I think this is, I've looked at other countries as well, um, I think this is true for probably almost all countries, um, that alongside an increase of, of online hate speech, you also see an increase of, of offline hate crime happening. Defining hate speech is one of the trickiest um, tasks, probably. So I'm just going to refer here to what the United Nations um, provide. And they define hate speech as any kind of communication in speech writing or behavior that attacks or uses pejorative or discriminatory language with reference to a person or a group on the basis of who they are. So basic identity factors such as 
religion, ethnicity, nationality, race, color, descent, gender, and other factors. So one thing, one problem is we have no universal understanding of hate speech. It's debatable whether that is even possible or desirable. Um, it's not a legal term of art um, in most countries. And an increasing problem is that it's becoming more and more multimodal. So we don't just have text that we can maybe uh, use a system to detect, but we have more and more a combination of text and image, um, such as memes. And another problem is, of course, that you have all the different social media companies that have their very unique guidelines and, and codes of conduct. Um, the current approach um, is still mostly content moderation, which is problematic because, first of all, it is reactive. So someone has to suffer from hate first, someone has to report it, and then maybe it will be deleted, a user might be blocked. And of course, that also raises questions of censorship. Um, another huge problem is the unethical side of the human content moderators. So the people who literally have to look through um, hundreds of, of posts a day and have basically no support system. Um, so this might be surprising or not. Um, even in Facebook internal documents, it was revealed last year that basically only up to 5% of hate is actually detected. Um, and Facebook does not really seem to bother very much about that. So hate speech is, of course, a, I guess a business model for Facebook. <laughs> um, and in a more recent context, um, in the spring or in February this year, um, it was found that Facebook is failing to label most of the posts that included um, Russian propaganda about Ukraine. So here you can just see um, a table of, of the different definitions, the different platforms, and you can see that um, according to some definitions, they, they have the same characteristics that they identify as hate speech um, and others that they don't. Um, then of course there have been different um, legal approaches or attempts at um, establishing legal regulations such as uh, Germany mostly, um, France, South Africa, um, but in most countries um, like the US um, we have no hate speech regulation, at least in a legal context. Okay, moving on to um, more of the AI-based techniques that have been suggested in this context, um, one of which is digital nudging. I'm not going to go into detail um, in these, on these um, different methods. Digital nudging, redirecting, style transfer, all kind of approaches that make suggestions to the user to like point them away from a potentially dangerous area and more towards um, something positive or just redirecting attention, I suppose. Um, also, social media bots, bots that have been specifically designed to interfere in potentially critical situations. Um, my colleague and I, Marcus Tomalin, um, we published a paper suggesting a kind of quarantining approach. Um, I'm also not going to go into detail now. <laughs> okay, I hope this is better for your ears. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have, if you have any, um, but now I'm going to spend the rest of the presentation focusing on counter speech. Um, I'm going to skip this um, just for the sake of time. So counter speech, what is counter speech? Um, if you're not familiar, um, the Dangerous Speech Project defines counter speech as any direct response to hateful or harmful speech, which seeks to undermine it. So the idea goes back to um, Louis D. Brandeis, that is my very German pronunciation. Um, Brandeis, okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, who said, um, 
If there be time to expose through discussion the falsehoods and fallacies, to avert the evil by the processes of education, the remedy to be applied is more speech, not enforced silence. So there are different types of counter speech um, that um, Susan Banish and her team of the Dangerous Speech Project uh, distinguish. So one would be to present facts to correct any kind of mispresentations, um, to point out hypocrisy or contradictions, to warn of offline or online consequences, to show affiliation with the victim. This is probably one of the most important to first of all denounce the hateful comment. Visual communication is also has been proven to be very uh, effective. Humor in some contexts can be, can be useful. And using an empathetic tone. So uh, striking back with more hate um, is counterproductive. Um, here are a few examples um, that you can look at. Um, in the middle we have a um, a multimodal example of combining text and image. I think with the other ones mostly illustrate things like remember that those you care about can see this post too, like pointing out to people um, this has wider consequences. This is not just you trying to insult someone on the internet. And also maybe uh, the example you can see on the right hand side um, saying I feel for you, I, I hope you're okay, like why, why, why do you put out this hate towards other people? Okay, um, one of the most important questions um, that has been asked is uh, can counter speech actually change the behavior of people? Um, and maybe another question is should that be the goal? What should be the goal of counter speech? Um, yeah, so um, yeah, I just want to studies, um, one of which has been conducted by Saltman and Russell that showed that um, online extremism, um, that counter speech can be effective in, the, um, in fighting online extremism. Um, it has also been found that it is more likely to be successful if one person is speaking to another individual rather than um, you're trying to change the minds of, of an entire group. Um, organized movements can be more effective than striking out on your own. And probably the most important um, aspect would be um, to reach the so-called bystanders, so to reach the, um, the people you're not trying to, you're very unlikely to change the mind and behavior of the perpetrator, but you could reach people who are just reading, listening. Um, it may increase the number of positive comments that follow. And another very important thing um, is empathy and um, morality and um, applying to those, to those qualities. Um, how much more time do I have? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> um, another interesting finding has been um, that the identity of whoever performs the counter speech um, tends to be important. Um, their identity and their social or political status. So it has, for example, in a study by Munger, um, been found that in in the context of, of racial harassment or racially based hate speech, um, interestingly, having someone who's white and male and has a high following, um, if a person like that speaks out or uses counter speech, it is more likely to reduce um, the amount of racially um, racial hate speech. Racially, oh God, <laughs> I'm very sorry. Um, yeah, something similar in the context of religious hate speech, um, where also it, it matters who is actually doing the counter speech. Um, another very important point um, that Berger uh, makes in the context um, of misinformation specifically 
is to actually be able to reach what she calls the interpreters. So the people who are most likely to retweet, repost something that entails misinformation to kind of inter, intersect intercept at that point and to stop people from reproducing false content. Um, and also quite interesting is that social and discourse norms still matter in this context. Um, so um, studies have shown that if hate, hate speech, for example, is moderately censored in the form of counter speech, for example, um, that people are less likely after that to produce hate speech. Um, I'm going to skip this and um, yes, the final um, segment of my presentation is now going to focus on attempts at automating counter speech. Um, for that, um, we need natural language processing. I'm not going to go into too much detail. We've also already heard a little bit um, from Karim about this, but we basically need um, computational tools to process large amounts of data both for hate speech detection as much as um, the generation of counter speech. Um, we've already heard about um, stance analysis, so sentiment analysis is very similar. So you basically use computational tools to study kind of people's opinions, their sentiments behind posts. So that's extremely relevant um, in order to, first of all, identify a hate speech comment but then also to find the right counter speech response or to generate the right response. Um, something else that is um, very useful in this context is network analysis. So if you, if you can get as much information as possible, for example, about a Twitter user, who do they follow, what, what are their followers, um, what are the kind of people, um, uh, they interact with mostly, what events do they attend, and so on. So basically find out as much as possible about the user's network. Okay, um, one of the biggest problems um, I want to mention um, in the attempt to automate counter speech is still to create or generate responses that are um, of high quality. Um, so basically to make them as diverse and relevant as possible to the hate speech comment. So for example, if you, if you just post a comment like, please refrain from using such language, or this goes against our guidelines, it's very unlikely to have any effect because it is a very generic and repetitive response. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, these are just, I apologize for the content of these. Some of these are, or all of these um, are horrific, except for the counter speech responses. But here you can just see, um, like on the left hand side is a very carefully constructed response um, to the original hate speech comment, like saying things, I fully understand that this is very scary. With fear, however, it does not really come irrational thinking. Um, writing purely racist things is not okay. Just, you know, accept each other. People are different. So this would be a very, but also constructed by a human. On the right-hand side, you can see differences in responses. You can see, again, a very carefully prepared expert response. But you can also see a very generic response, just saying hate speech is not tolerated and even a completely irrelevant response, the last one, um, which addresses a completely different type of hate speech. So um, diversity and relevance are extremely important. So this all comes down to basically the training data and the annotation of the data. And there are different um, ways of acquiring the data. One is Probably the easiest and, and fastest is just to use computational tools to scrape internet web pages um, and use that content um, to train a system. Um, a bit more complex is crowdsourcing. So still you use a crawling tool to scrape 
the web for data, but then you actually you pay humans to do the annotation, but these humans are lay people. They're not trained in, in any kind of conflict resolution. And then the most, most advanced, but also um, most, yeah, most expensive and um, most time consuming is niche sourcing. So to actually pay experts or to engage experts into um, producing the best counter responses and to use that kind of as um, as training data um, so over the last year we kind of we worked on on improving such an automated counter speech system um, so together with my with my colleague Marcus Tomalin and one of, of our students uh, at the University of Cambridge he used an already existing dialogue system um, and basically fine-tuned it with expert sourced data. Um, I will say more about that data in just one second. Um, yes, one of the downsides, so it was fine-tuned with that data, but also pre-processed with crowdsourced data. So which, so basically pre-processing and then fine-tuning to make it to make it, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, to make the, um, yeah, to, oh God, blackout. Um, yeah, to make it, to make the responses more efficient, but also at the same time, it, it meant that the actual general um, capabilities of the dialogue system kind of decreased a little bit. Um, the data that we used was, I would say, probably the best data set that currently exists, which is the Conan data set by Chung et al., uh, which is already a multilingual data set um, consisting of English, French, and Italian data, um, and consists of almost 15,000 um, pairs of hate and counter speech um, comments. So you can actually, um, if you want, uh, try this automated system yourself. <laughs> if you follow this link, um, it is not perfect. It, it is like the first version of this. Um, and these are some examples that it creates for, for example, a sexist comment like women are stupid. It, it would, uh, produce a counter comment like there is no evidence that women are less intelligent than men. What do you mean by stupid? Um, it would produce a response to Muslims are all terrorists. The vast majority of Muslims are peaceful people who have contributed to our country. They are our brothers and sisters um, and so on. So you can actually try it out yourself if you want. Um, yeah, it's not perfect. Uh, <laughs> very difficult task though I would say and this is why I will finish with this um, kind of emphasizing that in my opinion I think the best possible solution would be a human in the loop setting so you have a system um, that generates counter speech and maybe makes suggestions to a user in the form of, a, of an app or a browser extension but the user can make changes and can basically decide would this be a good fit for what I want to say or not. So this could could look a little bit like um, you know the, the smart compose and reply suggestions you get in Microsoft Office um, and something similar has already been um, suggested by by Chung et al last year who um, developed a system that generated counter speech messages but specifically for NGO workers. So if we had something like this for like the average social media user to give them ideas, to give them suggestions, but to basically leave it up to them to decide um, what they maybe want to add or delete from, from the comment, I think that will be a good solution. So to conclude, um, yeah, unfortunately, hate speech will most likely continue to exist. And um, I think we have to find approaches around legal regulation and also around the tech companies themselves. 
um, because they benefit from hate and misinformation and um, I think computational solutions um, can significantly ease the burden on individuals but um, yeah I believe in a in a combined human and computer approach as the ideal solution yeah thank you Thank you so much, Stephanie. I'm really looking forward to a Twitter integration where the counter speech, is, we can just use that automatically. That would save so much work. So as we're starting to talk about what possible approaches can we have towards countering hate speech, let's give the word to Alex, um, who is the person to go to when it comes to digital literacy. Hello, everyone. Hello. Ah, should turn that on. Um, and then make it big. I am going to start very negative, but I promise you I will end positive so we can have a, a positive ending to this. Um, thank you both. I, I, uh, you, you are doing very complex and important work, and I, and I hope what I talk about today can, um, can, can be another part of a holistic solution to the hate speech, polarization, and specifically what I work on is disinformation. So. I'm going to talk about how uh, media literacy, specifically digital media literacy, is an intervention that we can apply to fight all three of those things. Um, but before we get started, just to um, kind of quantify the problem with an anecdote, um, this ties together some stuff that we've talked about already, but um, who here has heard of the QAnon conspiracy? A few. Um, well, in, in the U.S., it's a it's kind of a nebulous conspiracy theory stating that um, Democrats are satanic um, pedophiles uh, and um, the world is controlled by Jews, which obviously none of that is correct at all. But it started out as a fringe conspiracy theory. But thanks to uh, algorithmic curation and social media, a lot of people in the U.S. believe it now. And it has fueled real world violence. This was a story from uh, just a few weeks ago, a father um, killed his wife and shot his family because he became entrenched in this uh, conspiracy theory. And that really, that ties together the hate speech, the polarization, and disinformation all into one uh, hateful, hateful evil act. Um, and the problem with that is it starts online, it spreads online, and then it leaks into real life. And in the U.S., this is something that's taking hold in the pillars of power. So um, on the left you see one of the first QAnon posts that really kicked off this conspiracy theory and now just the other week Donald Trump the former president of the US potential nominee uh, and potential future president of the United States uh, resharing a QAnon conspiracy theory so these these are, are starting online and thanks to algorithms spreading. Um, so we try to fight that at MediaWise. So um, I work for MediaWise. We're a digital media literacy organization. Our goal is basically to teach people to be able to see that QAnon or conspiracy theory post and immediately know it's fake and move on from it. And I'm really passionate about that because I spent a lot of years as a journalist. That's why I'm very uh, excited to be uh, speaking here um, uh, for this foundation. Um, and so a little bit about MediaWise before I get started. We've been around since 2018. And originally we started um, with something called the Teen Fact Checking Network. Originally, we were focused on trying to teach teens how to spot disinformation um, because we noticed that even though they grew up with iPads, they were really bad at sharing false news online. So uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Eventually, we expanded to older people. You probably have older relatives who share fake news more than your younger brother or sister. It is a serious problem, so we decided to uh, expand and start reaching older adults and then also college students. We saw the largest influx of new voters coming out of college, so we decided that's a demographic we needed to reach. And most recently this year, noting that media literacy is something that can help uh, across languages and across continents, we've launched programs uh, here in Turkey, but also for Spanish speakers in the US and France. Uh, Spain and Brazil. Our goal really is uh, threefold. We are a signatory of the International Fact Checking Network, so we're a fact checker. Uh, we want to educate. We teach media literacy. 
And then we've partnered with a lot of researchers to study different media literacy interventions, I call them. So the Teen Fact Checking Network is something we study to see if it actually works. And you will see it does work. So the challenge that uh, has really been brought up throughout the, the talk is uh, that social media platforms um, spread hate speech, disinformation, et cetera. They're always evolving. Um, there are new ones that are springing up all the time. Who hears on TikTok? So TikTok has, has become the new uh, purveyor of disinformation and I hate speech. They're better about stopping it a little bit, but um, you're also seeing disinformation in private streams. You've probably seen it on WhatsApp. Um, attention spans are shrinking and uh, people don't trust journalists anymore. So um, that is one big problem. The, the issue, and we've talked about this too, is that there are a lot of different solutions to this. Um, fact checking, uh, is it moderation? Uh, is it uh, like we talked about today, you know, using natural language processing to fight this, you know, from from both sides? Um, is it a supply or demand problem? And what we have uh, come up with at MediaWise is the idea of targeted digital media literacy. Um, it's something that we um, target specific communities to reach them with the tools that journalists use to identify mis and disinformation. So really our goal is to empower people to think like journalists or think like fact checkers as they navigate the internet. And this does a, a lot of things. One, we hope to catch people before they're sharing mis and disinformation. So they see a meme and they identify it as false and then they don't share it. We teach them the consequences and um, you know how, how to actually spot it. The other thing is, we want to build trust back in institutions. So if we teach people about how the news works, um, about uh, how algorithms are undermining our institutions, we can hopefully make people trust journalists more um, and you know, trust the institutions that I know in the US are, are really threatened right now, you know, from the news to the Supreme Court to, um, you know, to our government. There's, there's just a, a loss of trust in institutions. And we're really fighting myths and disinformation where it is. I mentioned TikTok and WhatsApp. We are in both platforms. So uh, what we teach is something that was developed by the Stanford History Education Group. They did a big study and they were trying to understand why fact checkers were so good at spotting disinformation. And they were also trying to figure out why students were so bad at it. And they came up with this, this solution, like these three questions that every journalist asks when they come across something online. Who is behind the information? What is the evidence? And what do other sources say? So everything we build, every time we teach anything, anytime I go to a school and do an hour long talk, it's all based around these three questions and teaching them the tools, um, the thought process, the techniques to actually answer those questions. And it really, it, it's this idea of pre-bunking disinformation, basically inoculating people against disinformation. So, so we feed them disinformation and show them what it's like, how it's created, and then that inoculates them against it in the future, you know, this, it's the theory behind, um, uh, behind vaccines. It really is the theory behind vaccines. We are trying to apply that to the digital world. And so what we do is we, we break down disinformation into a few different pillars. The main focus right now is videos. You talked about multimodal um, ways that uh, uh, people are encountering hate speech. It's the same thing with disinformation. People are seeing videos with text overlaid, but mainly it's, it's videos and just teaching them that when they see a video, there's probably parts that have been edited out. Um, there's, uh, it might be a, a real video, but a specific part was clipped out of it. Maybe it was slowed down a little bit. Um, we just try to teach the ways that videos can be manipulated. And then of course there is the deep fake issue. Um, not something that we are overly focused on right now, but just teaching about the concept of uh, AI created mis and disinformation is a way that we can empower our students, our older adults, uh, our Spanish speakers, anyone uh, with the ability, you know, so when they are navigating the internet, they're being more conscious about what they're seeing. 
if you know that that there is a very simple app out there that can uh, make Erdogan say what whatever you want him to say, then they might navigate the internet a little bit a little bit better. Images are always a huge way that we see mis and disinformation spread online. So we spend a lot of time going through kind of the classic styles of disinformation. These are out of context photos. So real photographs. Um, I saw a photographer earlier. Um, they could take a picture of me and someone could share it online, edit out these flags and replace them with like Nazi flags and say, you know, Alex Mahadevan spoke at a far right, you know, a far right, you know, this, uh, I thought he was brown. No, no, he was at a, a you know, a, a white spread. So I, we teach about um, out of context photos and how um, people can use real media, real media to manipulate things. And really that is the biggest threat there is the idea of using uh, real media to um, create mis- and disinformation. But we also teach about uh, manipulated photos. Uh, Dr. Oz, your friend and our friend now here in the US, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on what side you're on, um, but uh, political misinformation is something we talk quite a bit about. Um, and then graphics and data. Uh, statistics can mislead, and um, that's where you see some misinformation and falsehoods uh, spread online. Uh, screenshots, we, we talk a little bit about fake tweets and how you can screenshot a fake tweet and share it, and it's consumed and spread very quickly. Um, we, we, that's one of, the, one of the quickest ways that mis- and disinformation spreads is across platforms. So those who are on TikTok, you probably see TikToks on Instagram. And the problem there is that uh, mis- and disinformers can share things across platforms to uh, essentially launder where it came from. So hide who actually created the message or steal content or do all sorts of things, strip away the context of video. Uh, pink slime, this is uh, a, a very uh, American name for something, but the idea of false news websites, kind of the original idea of fake news. So these are websites that look a lot like a news website, but are either funded by uh, idiots who have no idea what they're doing, or really, really savvy politicians who are creating false news uh, or real news and inserting bias into it. So that is another big concept we teach. And then finally, uh, zombie claims. So Zombie claims are the idea of old mis- and disinformation that is shared again and again and again and again. So um, ever since 2021, every time a celebrity dies, and I don't know if you've seen this here in Turkey, I would think you probably have. Um, there's an example here. Every time a celebrity or politician dies, people online will say it's because they got the vaccine. So this is the idea of a zombie claim. Uh, in the future, you are going to see this come up a lot whenever it comes to immunizations or vaccines or anything like that. This is a, a claim that is going to spread often. And then what we like to do is just, just teach the concept of red flags, what to look out for when you uh, come across any post online, if it is triggering to your emotions, if it triggers fear, surprise, or anger, uh, if it's from an anonymous or unverified account, uh, and especially during breaking news. But we spend an entire hour module just teaching about emotional reasoning and how to understand your emotions when you are navigating the internet. There, um, the researchers we partnered with at Stanford are uh, all um, in, in psychology, more, more than communications, because there is such a psychological aspect to all of this, to sharing, to posting, uh, it's all tied together. Uh, so how do, we, how do we actually put this into action? So those are all the concepts we teach, and that's how we break out the mis- and disinformation. Um, but what are we actually teaching these teens to do? Like, how, how do you, so we know what, uh, how a meme can mislead. How can I actually go about fact-checking it myself? So that's what it comes down to, again, is teaching teens how to be their own fact checker. And so the, the cornerstone of this is something called lateral reading, which um, I, and this is a very, a very, might be a very English word, but lateral reading is the concept of reading across. 
So opening multiple tabs and doing lots of different searches, searching through journals, searching through data sources, instead of reading vertically. What we noticed is that teens only read vertically now. They only read up and down the page. So we're teaching them to leave the page and move on to something else. Um, another term we use is reading upstream. So that's going specifically straight up to the source, whether that is a, a scientific journal or a data point, or mostly for fact checkers, speeches. Teaching teens how to um, actually go about and find a speech itself. And then for all those images and videos that I talked about, we spend a lot of time teaching uh, reverse image searching. So using uh, tools and search engines, um, OSINT techniques to track down the original place of a photo. That, that way you can put it into context. So really all of those are ways that you can go about answering those, those three questions. Now I'll just, uh, uh, I'll, I'll wrap by talking quickly through the products, our, our products or interventions or how we take all of this and, and actually distribute it to the different demographics. Um, so I mentioned the, the teen fact checking network. So this is a, one of the most exciting things I worked on and one of the first things I worked on at MediaWise, this is a fully functional digital newsroom of 13-year-olds to 18-year-olds who are finding claims that they see on Twitter, on Snapchat, on Instagram, on TikTok. They are fact-checking them and then they are distributing those fact checks on those four different channels. So they're not only um, at the source of mis and disinformation, but they are reaching their peers with a debunk of, of a claim that they've actually seen, so that's actually relevant to them. So it's not, you know, not something about George Soros or even QAnon. The te teenagers do not care about that. Teenagers care about very specific, uh, somebody was just telling me about fluoride in the water, something that Gen Z is, is worried about right now. Uh, so the Teen Fact Checking Network is how you combine um, that effectiveness of digital media literacy with going right to the source. Um, and with each of these fact checks, there is a pre-bunking to it. They teach you how and, and why that mis and disinformation spread. Uh, we are on college campuses. So this is, again, peer-to-peer uh, -peer teaching. Um, we have eight to 10 college students who virtually travel to colleges around the US and do what I'm doing now. They, they sit in front of their peers and give a media literacy presentation. So they're, they're actually reaching their peers and empowering their peers to, to become kind of media-wise ambassadors in their own right. And the most recent thing and, and, and the, the most exciting and most scalable way that we're going to be able to um, empower people to separate fact from fiction online are WhatsApp media literacy courses. So these are courses, um, the one we specifically launched here in, in Turkey, we partnered with uh, Bilgi University, and it is a, a course that you can sign up for, or you can sign your friends up for, you can sign your uh, nieces, nephews up for, you can sign your parents most specifically up, up for, and for 10 days, they get a WhatsApp message that's that small and it teaches them something very specific about how to identify mis and disinformation then along with that they get a video from a media wise ambassador who explains even deeper so they might get they might get a, a whatsapp message explaining the concept of deep fakes and then they would see a video on how deep fakes work how algorithms work um, all of this pre-bunking uh, right at the source the the one of the big, biggest purveyors of mis and disinformation are family members on WhatsApp. Um, I am still, in, I have lots of Indian family on our Indian family WhatsApp group, and it is, it is insane and infuriating. Um, but that's what we're trying to do here is really inoculate people at the source. And uh, you might recognize uh, Ismail. He is our MediaWise ambassador. Obviously, that's not correct anymore. Uh, he has changed channels. But, uh, but th the goal here is to show um, Turkish citizens someone that they can trust um, and really break down barriers that may come with that. And, and we're seeing a lot of result, really good results so far. So um, greater than 30% completion rate. We have uh, well over 20,000 users now in our courses across the world, um, millions of video views. 
And um, we're studying this WhatsApp course. So we've partnered with, uh, obviously, Bilgi, as I mentioned, um, but a, a few other universities in Spain and uh, Brazil. And we've already found that this these courses can increase the ability of someone's ability to detect disinformation by uh, up to 16%. So I will end it there. Hopefully, I didn't go too much over time. But uh, I, I did want to end, hopefully, like I, I, we are seeing a lot of really positive results with these media literacy interventions. And they're very, very new. Um, we want to do lots more of them. So um, you can actually use this QR code if you are so inclined now and sign up for uh, our WhatsApp course here in Turkey, as I can see, all of you are excitedly doing right now. Uh, <laughs> so I will, I will end it there. Thank you so much, Alex. It's great to, I think this was a great presentation by all of you. Thank you again for laying out the big picture and what are different approaches that we can take to counter hate speech and disinformation. Um, so now is the time uh, to, ask, to get some questions. So um, if you have any questions, now is the time to go. Yes. We'll start with you. Okay, so we are doing a lot of things that actually we would like Twitter to do, for instance, right? So, so much energy, automated counter speech, you know, uh, disinformation trainings and so on. So I get questions about, in my mind, like, should we force Twitter and TikTok and so on to train, mm -hmm. to change, you know, to uh, stop it at the source? And then, then I think, if we did that, uh, would people move to another platform, you know? Uh, but then, at least, as a user, what I would like is, I would like even if Twitter is not stopping hate speech towards me, I would like to have the option of st saying that I don't want to see any hate speech. Like, I don't want to turn off the comments fully, but I want to turn off hate speech comments. I should be able to ask Twitter to do that, for instance. So I'm saying in summary, we should work more towards pressuring these big companies that are so somehow benefiting from all of this uh, divide. Thank you. Uh, by the way, it was an awesome presentation. I really enjoyed it. I should have started with that. Sorry. Um, actually, I forgot to present myself. So I, I'm the founder of Gözlemevi, um, which means Observatory for Turkish. And we work exactly for that, which we pressure big tech companies by doing some policy recommendations and investigations. So thank you so much for uh, just taking that out in the beginning. And I think all of our presenters, uh, I'm sure they will have a take on this answer. So um, yes, aside from the work you do, what do you think about the role of tech companies um, and what they should do? What should be our role um, in pressuring them? Uh, thank you for such an excellent question. So it seems, as you mentioned, that we're trying to uh, to counter something with, with uh, like lay people are trying to counter giants. I mean, media companies feed on misinformation, feed on polarization, and they are actually one of the primary sources of, of what we are seeing now. Uh, if uh, people are walking down the street, they wouldn't be looking at people who are sitting down and chatting, having a peaceful chat with each other. But if two people start fighting in the street, people will stop and watch, right? So constantly media companies like in the US, on one side, uh, Fox News, on the other side, MSNBC, and if you're on social media, uh, the YouTube and, and, and Facebook try to push you to be either on the right or the left, or whatever polarization that they have, because polarization sells. It's part of their business model. And without intervention, where we tell people, look, you, you companies, you know, stop what you're doing, and you know, probably peaceful press pressure would not work. Government pressure has to, with some regulation or something like that. Otherwise, we it's a David versus Goliath type fight. Um, yes, I, I agree. That's a really, really important question. Um, I'm not sure I have an answer to that. Um, <laughs> I feel like 
um, I'm kind of cautious when it comes to, I mean, what do we mean by saying we have to do something to force these companies? Like, are we talking legal regulation? Um, I mean, I'm German. In Germany, we have some kind of hate speech regulation um, where company or like, yeah, companies are forced to, but you still have the, the whole problem of someone needs to read a message and needs to report it and then the companies are forced to take it down but i feel like it's it's i don't see a way of of legally forcing these companies to um to stop it all you know from the very beginning and i mean i i think unfortunately we see um these companies have all the technological tools they have the best, they're not using them um, for exactly the reasons that Kareem already already mentioned. So kind of, I mean, this is not a very <laughs> um, positive uh, answer probably, but this is exactly why we have been focusing, or at least the team that I'm part of, have been focusing on looking at applications and, and browser extensions and things like that, that kind of the user at least can use if they really want to to have something to protect themselves. But yeah, essentially you would ideally have a company like Twitter implement, I don't know, a counter speech button or something something similar. But yeah, I, I honestly don't have an idea of how to do that. We actually had this exact same conversation with Alex. And um, yeah, so now someone else is yeah, <laughs> I, uh, hold on, did I turn it off? It's, all, uh, it's off right now, so you can turn it off, yeah. Whoops, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I don't have a good answer for this. I mean, would, 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 you, would you feel comfortable with the current government here in this country um, passing regulations to dictate who can post and, or, or, or the accountability of any product out out there especially like mass media products would you feel comfortable with that well they're doing it today by yeah. the way <laughs> yeah so so i think that's that's the argument in the us you know where where we do have the first you know the first amendment and there are, are very strong speech protections in the us and that's really the um there were, there was a, a a huge outcry when um the biden administration appointed um essentially a disinformation czar uh, a, a department to deal with disinformation, and it was immediately dissolved because both people on the left and really smart people that I respect with respect on the left were saying it, it is very difficult to to uh, <laughs> to regulate speech and define disinformation. You talked about how difficult it is to define just hate speech. So I I don't think there's much um, the government can do beyond, I mean, there are regulations about algorithmic transparency. So requiring, um, requiring these platforms to make public how they're showing people the, the crap that they're, sh the stuff that they're showing them. Um, they can, I'm just trying to think of cigarettes in the US. I mean, it's nobody smokes in the US anymore. Um, I kind of wanted to start smoking here in Turkey. Just uh, they're, they're, like, it is very weird to see people smoking because nobody smokes in the US because there was a, a, a government, um, not a crackdown, but there was like a public information uh, um, push to label cigarettes and label the problems with cigarettes. Now I have nothing against smoking. I am a former smoker, but it, it, it's some, that is something the government can do is highlight the harms. Um, but really, it is, it is the economic system of many countries in, <laughs> on this planet is based off of the idea of profit extraction. And that is how these companies have grown. That is how they function. There is no way around it whatsoever unless we were to completely smash the economic system that, uh, of which all of this is based on. So um, that's, that's why I always kind of default back to media literacy is because if we can grab some money from funders, and we are funded by a lot of tech companies, and put that into something good and put it into something scalable, then then that is that's where we're able to get away from the First Amendment stuff. Yes. So, I mean, like you mentioned the word economics here. It's a very, very important, uh, you know, word. Like, for example, in the case of cigarettes, a lot of it was not just the information, but the economic disincentive to smoke, right? 
So, and, and I mean, like we, we're kind of the city in the situation with tech companies where, you know, misinformation is profitable. And I don't know how you, you can actually change the economics of the game to make it unprofitable. I, don't, I, I mean, like, I don't have an answer, obviously, but, but probably economics would have to do a large part, be a large part of the solution. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, do we have any other questions from the crowd in here? Yeah. Um, yeah, there will be a translation, right? Yeah. Uh, first it's too useful for me okay. uh, my question is too long and I speak Turkish I'm very sorry uh, so my question is especially in Turkey hate speech really works I mean your presentations were very valuable but in Turkey although you pay attention to hate speech in order to take a job in the public you have to develop hate speech because in recruiting employees they control your social media i may not be supporting party b but i have to pretend i support party b and i have to look like i'm attacking party c through hate speech so the measurement methods in your presentations i totally agree with them but how can you measure their reliability because i may not be hating inside but i might just pretend that i hate how can you measure the reliability of these methods because in my opinion hate speech really works it has a function even if i don't genuinely hate i can just use hate speech to reach some results and second we talk about private companies and twitter instagram we talk about th them but as long as the public is not involved as long as there are not legal measures this hate speech will not stop it cannot be stopped so my question is the attack is so powerful especially in our generation you don't have a chance to give a healthy response to this attack when you, I have difficulty responding to hate speech, it's so much, and you cannot really give a healthy response to hate speech. I mean, because the attack is so powerful. For example, the hate speech, especially in Turkey, is developed based on an idea you know perhaps the answer is not hate speech but the attack is so powerful right now in the media in turkey i mean there are so many different groups doing this so the response is perceived as hate speech automatically although it's not hate speech it's just defending yourself so basically i have a problem with the measurement of the reliability of I'll start with um, the first question is um, in such a case it was a turkey specific example that you might have to actually generate hate speech even if you don't want to so it can be a function or a means of control it can be an instrument um, so you might have to show your polarization and do you have any experience in regard to um, identifying and measuring those circumstances and secondly, I think the question was about, um, you know, when there's a hate speech and then is there any lines crossing between hate speech and defensive speech or how do you actually respond to an extreme trigger um, that might kind of put you in kind of hate speech position? So what are the, how do we define, in, in a contextual sense, how do we define those speeches? Tough questions from the Turkish crowd. It's a very tough question. I'm, I'm just still <laughs> thinking through it, so. <laughs> yeah. um, Maybe I, maybe I can start. Um, I would like to start with the second part of your question. Um, so first of all, I think counter speech or countering hate speech should never be the victim's task. So I find that is, is basically just too much to ask. This is why it's so important that other people who are just bystanders um, say something, use their voices. Um, 
And also, I, I think for some cases of really extreme hate speech, um, there should definitely be laws. Um, and like in Germany, certain things are illegal to say for obvious reasons based on the history of the country. And I think, um, yeah, certain things should be regulated legally. Um, and with regard to the first part of your question, I think that that is such a good point um, and also a very disturbing point, but um, it, it shows how contextual the use of hate speech is, that in, in, some, in some countries, in some areas, it might be completely condemned, but in other areas, and we've seen this in, in the States as well with Donald Trump, that it's kind of even at a, at a high political level it is um, profitable to use hate speech. Um, and maybe, um, although like, as I'm thinking about it, I'm already questioning it, but um, <laughs> because I think for some, um, I feel like this is even a bit more extreme than just online hate speech, because you also have, you have people standing on a stage using hate speech, um, and these are leaders of countries, and I would say we absolutely need legal measures to, to, to stop that, but uh, of course, then maybe on a transnational level, because of course, if the ones in power are the ones using hate speech, this is getting very complicated. So, um, yeah, I'm, I think it, it just shows really well how based on context it is and also why it is so difficult to find um, an international or universal, um, first of all, definition of hate speech and then obviously also countermeasures. I hope that maybe you have something. <laughs> Can say something, or you can go right there. Go ahead. Um, okay. Yeah, that that is a really good question. And again, I'm approaching this from the U.S. standpoint, where we have very, very strong speech protection. As a you know former journalist, it's something that I care very much about. Um, so, in in the on your point of criminalizing hate speech, I do think there is room to expand the concept of hate crime. So in the United States, we have, you know, the hate crimes. So someone can, someone can find my Instagram and they can call me all sorts of names and nothing's going to happen to them. But if they come to my house and spray paint something on the side of my house, they will be charged with a hate crime. And um, I think that if there is, there is a way that I think we can expand the idea of hate crimes in the U.S. to include some online speech, but it is a tricky line to walk. Um, I think it's something that, and I hate to, this is, this is um, avoiding the point, I think, but in a way we, c we could leave it uh, up to U.S. court systems if we were to expand the, the concept of, of hate crimes. I think that's something that they could do. And then on the other point about uh, using hate speech, you know, as a tool uh, in the US, this is something fact checkers have seen a lot, is that you're starting to see people from both sides of a political spectrum using disinformation and hate speech. So because they're seeing that it is a very effective tool, they're using it. And now it's just making our jobs a lot harder. It, and regardless of where you stand in politics or, you know, rights, it, 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 it is something that has just polluted the media ecosystem. Um, so we're, we're definitely seeing that in the, in the United States as well. I just want to make a very brief comment to that because um, I find that really important. Um, we kind of have to watch out that with any form of, of regulation, um, that it's not abused to demonize whoever is of a different opinion. So if, if in America, Republicans um, form the government, um, maybe come up with, with hate speech regulations, make sure that it's not just used to demonize 
um, democratic voices, left-wing voices. I think that's always a very fine line to not just abuse it as a tool to demonize um, opposing views. So, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, I'll, I'll start with the second part, like uh, <laughs> Stephanie did. <laughs> so, for the second part, as far as the reli reliability of measurement, so one thing that we look at is not the absolute number. We're looking at relative numbers in the sense that where is the state of polarization today and how does it look like tomorrow? Is it increasing or decreasing? Because measuring something so accurately on, on social media, especially with all the trolls and all the bots and, and, and so on and so forth, things become difficult. But you, what you would like to do is see and say, here's the baseline, or and then we're going above the baseline, we're going below the baseline. So absolute measurement is yani, uh, all muzz, okay? <laughs> so, so, so that's the first part uh, for the second question. For the, for the first question, uh, before I actually delve into the answer, I mean, I'd like to, to, to reiterate some of the things that, uh, that my colleagues here mentioned uh, as far as regulation is concerned. And actually, like one, one thing that was, that was uh, when, when, this, when all social media companies in the US decided sometime, I think it was in January uh, 2000, uh, 2021, they decided to ban uh, Donald Trump from all the, from all the, for the, from all the platforms. I don't particularly like Donald Trump, but the idea that private companies can make decisions like this to banish somebody from the internet completely is a very dangerous thing, right? Because they can banish you, some, somebody that you don't like today, and then banish you tomorrow, right? I mean, just putting this amount of power into, into private, private hands is, is very, very uh, scary. Now, going back to your first question. So one thing that, that, that um, I mean, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take multiple parts of this, uh, if you don't mind. The first part is, why do people use this kind of discourse, right? People use this kind of discourse because they feel some sort of pressure somehow. So, for example, in, one, in, some, in some country, without mentioning names, there is economic difficulty. So, somebody comes out and says, it's the foreigners who are the problem. In the US, for example, they said it's the Mexicans that are the problem. In other countries, they say it's a different group of people that are the problem. And then you get this narrative continuously happening and people looking for a way out of the misery that they're in. So people's core issues need to be addressed. If they are facing, for example, you know, economic uh, you know, uh, hardship, then the issue of economic hardship needs to be addressed so people can find a way out of the problem that they have. So that's, a one, that's one thing. The other thing that is really, really important is the humanization of the other side. For example, you know, uh, the people who are, you know, who are different from you, they are people who have children, who, you know, go to work, they ride public transportation, they might eat at the same, you know, the same restaurant that you like. They are humans just like you, right? So the humanization of the other side is extremely important. Because as polarization grows, the, the idea of dehumanizing the other side to the point that you would not employ somebody who is actually on the, uh, on the other end of the spectrum. I mean, in some countries, I mean, I, you, you just go, you sort of surprise. You go to one university and everybody looks the same. And then you go to the next university and everybody looks completely different. And you're like, that. That cannot be right. I mean, I mean, the society is a lot more diverse than this. How can you segregate like this, right? Some of you have, might have seen this in some places, right? So, so this idea that the other side is less human needs to be broken down. Uh, that the other side is human and the humanization and then mentioning the stories of people. I mean, there was, uh, there was uh, an instance of uh, there was, uh, the Syrian uh, teenager who they stopped on the street. You might, some of you might have seen the interview and the hashtag came out at the end that I'm human also like everybody else. This is important that people see that there's a human on the other side. So 
humanization is important and the addressing of core issues in society are really, really, really important. Because without direct you know, attention to the problems that people have on a day-to-day -day basis, somebody's going to come and they're going to say, the problem that you're having is because of this other person. And people who don't know better will probably believe it. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Kareem. I think it really delves into the issue that misinformation and hate speech are, you know, not just uh, something that we can solve within ourselves, but they trace back to bigger societal issues. And um, like you said, dialogue and remembering that we're human and empathy is um, really at the core. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, this is going really exciting, by the way. We're actually talking about economy and monopolies and governments and regulation. Tech is everything. So um, any more questions? Um, yes, I'll do one, two, three. So maybe I'll start. Um, or maybe we can, sorry, we can start there. Yeah. So you all did it at the same time, so. Uh, well, uh, thank you for the uh, great uh, presentation uh, for all. And uh, this is contributing uh, to me too much. Thank you. And uh, I have uh, two questions. First of all, do you think that anonymity uh, encourages people to uh, speak in a way that, that they are hating yeah. each other? And also, if we ban the anonymity in social media, could it be effective for hate speech? The first one is that. Uh, the second one is about Web 3.0. Uh, so I have to ask that Web 3 uh, Web 3.0 uh, is offering us a world that platforms connect such uh, will not be effective anymore. So. There will be no Google, there will be no Facebook, maybe. So we can identify ourselves to one another per person. So do you think that in Web3.0 uh, will be effective in uh, hate speech? Uh, thank you. Can I, can I, can I take uh, the yeah, first? Sure. So I'll, I'll just answer the first question if you don't mind. So uh, hiding behind the screen makes people indulge in, in, uh, in misbehavior m far more often if they were public. So there was this study where the people were allowed to play a, a video game and there was a chance that they might cheat. I mean, there were tools for them to cheat. And, it's, and th the funny thing about this experiment is that when they had people wear sunglasses, the propensity of them cheating increased because they felt more anonymous. And that's why in many countries, especially like repressive regimes, they have police wear masks. So they are more brutal when they handle uh, protesters. So I, I'll come at it from a different way. So I, I think there is also, there, there are some positives that come out of anonymity. Um, I'm thinking of whistleblowers. I'm thinking of marginalized groups who feel too afraid to speak out, specifically on Twitter. Um, there has been, you know, Elon Musk, blah, 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 like he's, you know, going to buy Twitter or whatever. And, and one of the suggestions was um, forced de-anonymization. So forced, what is the, whatever. Uh, so basically forcing people to prove they're human and post under their own name and, and image. And the danger I see in that is that you are going to be crowding out marginalized groups or groups that um, uh, don't have a voice. And um, it, it, I, I think there is a, a great amount of good that can come out of getting rid of anonymous accounts, but I don't think it outweighs giving voice to um, the voiceless. And I, I, I am only speaking from like the US standpoint. I mean, it, it could absolutely vary, vary by country, but I know um, I would be worried about the effect on um, whistleblowers and um, yeah, you know, um, uh, marginalized demographics. Um, thank you, Alex. Actually, the, one of the um, solutions that was proposed for this was um, that you don't have to, you can be anonymous, but you have to actually give your phone number. So this um, can be maybe a middle ground that you don't have to foreclose who you are, but then you also can't make a thousands of bots um, I guess there's a lot of 
work happening there um, to address that issue. Um, any more questions? I think we had a couple people on here, and then we'll head on to you afterwards. Hello, and thank you for your presentations. Uh, my question is about echo chambers. Uh, is it actually possible to avoid like echo chambers or cyber balkanization uh, in online spaces? Because like echo chambers like a natural phenomenon and people tend to follow or listen sources, they inform their norms. And uh, it's like a natural phenomenon. Uh, so is it actually possible to like avoid or like uh, de de demolish the echo chambers? I will take that. Thank you. Who wants to take that? <laughs> I can try. Um, I would say yes. Um, I mean, there are different technologies or methods that do exactly the opposite of always showing the same kind of content or similar content like redirecting searches. I feel like the pandemic had, has at least cause social media companies like Meta to implement redirect searches so that if you are searching for specific information that is um, likely to be false information that they actually redirect your search to the World Health Organizations to reliable information. So I would say there are definitely methods to break echo chambers. The question is it's once again up to those in power, so the big tech companies, to actually implement these methods, I would say. Any other takes on the question? Unfortunately, I'm less hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, I mean, like, it is possible. I mean, you have to work really hard as an individual to go outside of your echo chamber. But uh, YouTube and Facebook, more so than maybe other, uh, you know, media like Reddit is is, is far less in, the, in this in this regard. Uh, they push you into an echo chamber because it's it, it, for them is just more profitable to do. And for you to go out, you have to make a conscious decision to go out. Like, for example, sometimes, many, oft, oftentimes, I actually go on YouTube in incognito mode just so I can see something different than, you know, the usual junk that uh, YouTube keeps recommending to me, right? But normal users, you know, the, the odds are stacked against them, unfortunately. Sorry. I, well, I, I, I was going to say that echo chambers have existed long before social media platforms. I mean, there, there are studies that have shown that the propensity to, for, the, there was a, a study that showed that, you know, there, there was this massive increase in the, the chances that you would marry someone like from almost your own elementary school, you know, so these, these socioeconomic like groupings have, have existed for a long time. I, I do think, so, uh, to bring it back to media literacy, one of the, foundations we teach is about algorithms and echo chambers and i think if you if you help young people understand actually older people they don't know how the internet i mean all due respect but like the old people i don't i know i aren't don't really know how algorithms work and if you help them understand the sorting that algorithms do and um why that the things that they see online are being chosen for them then i think they're more likely to be um active social media users i think the news feed on facebook has trained us to to be we live in these echo chambers because we're scrollers because we're not active internet users anymore you know we we don't read beyond the headline um so i i do think um i i, I do think you know some of these suggestions are are really helpful um but really shaking up the the algorithm is one thing it's a good question. And the web 3.01, that's a really good question that I have no answer for. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you, I guess we, um, uh, I was just wondering that uh, if we are, if we are going to live in a decentralized system like blockchain or something like that, if we are going to text each other without using any social pl social media platform like Google or Facebook or Twitter, how are we going to 
um, regulate our speeches and how are we going to regulate our social bubbles you know so if web 3.0 is going to offer us more hate speech uh, i don't know if it is good or bad for us uh, i was just wondering wh how do you think you know uh, i guess we're all busy dealing with the problems of web 2.0 but <laughs> I, I guess exactly. if you have any answers Me neither. <laughs> um, we had a Sorry, third so question much. here that was waiting for quite some time. Actually, should I be? Yeah. Uh, I don't have a question. Just I'm still thinking about if how we can increase the pressure on these companies, and uh, I would like to. I am thinking about the UN guiding line uh, uh, on business and human rights, guiding principles on business and human rights. And as you know, on the guiding principles, they, uh, the, it says that businesses has to show respect to human rights. And so they have to be sure that the activities are not giving any damage or harm to any human rights and freedoms. So just I'm thinking if there's any case that brings, you know, that links both of them. And the second thing is that, as I know, there's an OECD mechanism uh, for especially for multinational companies and uh, they have national local points uh, that you can go and complain uh, have a complaint about these big companies and even in Turkey we have I don't know how people are using but the NGOs have the right to apply also not just the local people as I know for Hassan K for example there is an application in the national uh, focal point so if this kind of any of these mechanisms, I don't know, just I'm thinking if we can use them as a tool for to increase, you know, pressure on these companies. So, do you guys have any comments? Um, yeah. Actually, our organization works for pressuring big tech companies, so you can maybe check Gözlemevi, gözlemevi.io. We have some strategies laid out for that. I did a, sorry, I did a bit of product placement <laughs> in the middle of the speech, but it, it was so relevant, I, I had to. Yeah, please go on. Yeah, uh, I have seen in the news that uh, state-owned Anadolu agency in Turkey established a fact-checking company or desk or something like this. And do, it, uh, do you see this kind of state involvement in fact-checking business in other countries too, or is it something unique to Turkey? <laughs> That's uh, I I should know more about that. I mean, I've been so I've been so uh, delved into the media literacy side that I haven't been up on the fact checking news. That is, um, I wouldn't think that they're a signatory of the International Fact Checking Network. Um, the International Fact Checking Network does a really good job at um, requiring organizations to be transparent, to be to 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 be to have a clear un non bias, which I don't think that's possible for a state owned um, fact checking unit. Um, so I ha speaking from the, the US standpoint that that is not something we have seen yet. And um, I think that is something we don't <laughs> want to see. And, and unfortunately, in, in a lot of countries that um, that that don't have news infrastructure or fact checking infrastructure, that is always a threat. So um, the IFCN, I brought up the International Fact Checking Network. We're always trying to go to areas of the world that don't have really solid fact checking infrastructure, so we can find independent journalists who want to become fact checkers. So our goal is to to do that before government intervention. But that's that's really interesting. I'll have to talk to my colleagues about that. Yeah. Thank you, first of all. So it was really uh, fruitful for all of us. Uh, I, I was wondering those uh, automated tools, uh, can they uh, really detect irony? Or, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know, irony is something really difficult, let's say. It is easy to understand for all of us as well. Um, and the other thing, it is also common that uh, some minority groups take some tags that are offensive against them but they are using and owning it for example n-word or uh, fags word mm -hmm. uh, so can these machines uh, detect these and differentiate from the uh, hate speech let me take that question yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay you? so this is actually a good question 
uh, if you want to, so irony is one of the more one of the more difficult problems inside of NLP, and people have been working on this for uh, for quite a few years, and the results are terrible. Okay, this is not to say that there are no other workarounds around this. So what actually happens is that people's stances on multiple issues are 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 kind of almost static. So for example, if I'm a Barcelona fan. If I like, you know, or uh, Galatasaray, for example, a fan, right? I'll be a fan of this club uh, today, tomorrow, next year, and the year after. So my position is going to be fairly fixed. And detecting my position on a particular topic using my inter lots of interactions on social media is fairly easy and highly accurate, right? So the idea is that once, if you, if you instead of trying to, to uh, to identify one piece of text as irony, or maybe it's on this side, or maybe the person is making a joke, right? Uh, is much is is much harder. So if you focus on on the individual and say this person has this position, then if they are saying something that apparently looks like uh, you know support for the other side, it's most likely ironic, right? It's not it's not real, right? So uh, so. If you're if you're doing this from a technological standpoint, uh, focus on context instead of a single statement. And the other thing is focus on social interactions more than the text that people are using. So let let me give you an example. If I never talk about politics ever, I only talk about football. By just knowing which news source I put, you know, which article from which news source came the news about the, uh, the the football that I care about. For example, I'm always, you know, getting my football news from Fox News. That means I'm listening to Fox News on other things too, right? And even though I never mention politics, my position can probably be, I might be, I'm most likely right-leaning. So who you quote is actually more important than what you say. So focusing on social interaction and looking at the context, the context of the person is much more important than the actual text. Any other takes? Um, yeah, I just want to add something um, with regard to the, the, the last part of your question, um, meaning not correctly identifying if someone is using it because they're part of a group and kind of, um, that is actually a huge problem in hate speech annotation um, when humans annotate a hate speech comments and because there is so little diversity usually amongst human annotators, they're often not familiar with African-American vernacular English or with, with words that might just be used um, amongst the LGBTQ community. So um, I, it's a huge problem. Um, I think we need a lot more diversity uh, amongst human annotators because I think we still rely on them very much. Um, and yeah, that's a that's a really good point um, that that you made. I don't have an answer to that question. But um, yeah, it's it needs more awareness and it needs more, um, more work in that area. Uh, well, I was just gonna say, you know, it, beyond the algorithms, I, fact checkers struggle with this quite a bit and, and how to label satire and, and irony. And, and I, I mean, I, I personally think I love fact checkers. I work with fact checkers, but I think they fall into this trap of fact checking satire and irony, and it makes them look like losers. I mean, it makes them look like dorks online and then it makes us, it may, it, it so I, but I, but I do think, you know, fact checkers are very careful that a, a piece of irony reaches a certain level of virality that it's being shared by people who actually believe it. So that threshold, I don't know. I don't know the exact threshold for it, but that is absolutely something that fact checkers on the human side struggle with quite a bit. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Well, we're about to run out of time, so we can take one last question from the audience. Okay, so I'll, um, I'll go ahead and um, ask some questions. As, um, so we are always talking about the bad stuff and the polarized society 
and um, you know how how it looks like on the data. So how do you dream of like an ideal world, which is not polarized, is based on dialogue and empathy? How how would the information ecosystem and the data and the literacy skills would look like? Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, so I, I don't necessarily know what it looks like, but I know where it will start. Um, and that will start with more integrated and diverse communities. Um, I think everything we've talked about uh, from hate speech to polarization to uh, disinformation is all because we're split into groups. I mean, we talked about echo chambers. We've talked about all of this. So I, I went to high school at a very diverse high school, but I only got in because I was a musician and I wanted to play in the the band that was there and it completely changed my outlook on life and i thought about things a completely different way from the socioeconomic background that i that i came from um i i don't know how we can actually do that but i think what we the, the future that we look for in a kind of harmonious uh fact-based online ecosystem will start with uh more diverse communities um more integrated communities uh across demographics and economics. Um, but, you know, for me, I just have to say from, from Pointer and from MediaWise, it is a world in which um, conversations are had, policies are crafted, uh, laws are passed based on reality and facts. And if I had to estimate, I would say it's like 10% right now, facts online. So um, what I see is, you know, a fact-based world, and that's a very boring answer to the question. <laughs> um, yeah, I basically just want to agree. I, I think diversity is, is most important, increasing diversity, especially in the whole tech field, um, because it is still very much... Um, a male and white dominated um, area. And we see that in the development of, of algorithms, of systems, in the annotation, they're like problems. It's the same problem at, at different steps and it always comes down to at least one part of the problem being it's not diverse enough um, and it, it doesn't, it, it only focuses on a very, very privileged group of, of people um, and also another huge problem that I would like to see kind of tackled more in the future is focusing on l languages that are not as dominant as English or, or Spanish or Arabic but also focusing on the smaller languages because a lot of people speak languages that are not widely widely spread and they rely some of these people rely heavily on social media and the internet, but they're just not represented, so. So allow me to take a different tack to this question. So um, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the robber's cave experiment by uh, a researcher, his name is Muzaffar Sharif, he's actually Turkish. And uh, basically what he did was he took children who are white, Protestant, same age, same grade, live in a, in a in very close proximity, same uh, you know socioeconomic status and everything, and and split them into two groups, and made the two groups within two or three days hate each other, and fight each other. By just artificially introducing you know uh, differences between them that were not real, and then a few days later after things have gotten really really heated up. He changed the rules of the game where he said, oh, now we have a common problem that we all have to face. Like, for example, you know, the, the water tank was broken and they need to push the bus and so forth. And then within another three days, we're best friends. Okay. So the, the idea here is instead of saying, oh, this, you're that group and that group and that group and so forth, crafting a common identity for people is really, really important, where everybody sees themselves as one whole, right? We might be different from each other, but at the end, we are, there are more similarities between them than, are, than differences. And focusing on the commonality between us as humans is important. 
I would like to, I'm sorry for, for digressing this about this. So there are two co examples that I actually want to mention, two historical examples. The first one is, you might have heard of the word Han Chinese, right? This is what most Chinese are. But actually that was not the case long ago. So there used to be many, many, many tribes uh, in, in, in China. And then when the Han reaches, reached power, instead of focusing on the differences between the tribes, they said, well, if you speak like us, you're one of us. And then all the people who lived in China became Han Chinese. So it was an artificial construct that brought everybody together. The other example is uh, when, when the Arabs in, in the Arabian Peninsula, they used to say, you're from that tribe, you're from that tribe, I'm better, my tribe is better than this and this and that. And as the Muslims started going in other places, they had this saying of the Prophet ﷺ, where he said, "Inna al Arabiya to lisan." Uh, Arabic is being Arab is just what you speak. If you speak Arabic, you're Arab. That's it. If you speak Turkish, you're Turkish. That's it. Khalas. You know, right? I mean, there's there's nothing more to this. And once you put the boundary so wide that anybody can come into the common, you know, identity that people identify with, you may able to succeed at the end. Thank you so much, Karim. I think this kind of lays out, you know, we need facts, we need diversity, and we need a communal identity. And maybe we can leave this with a positive note that, you know, we are all working toward dialogue and change. And I would like to thank Ranting Foundation, first of all, for bringing this, these people together. Thank you to the crowd for the amazing, uh, com honest conversation. And thank you to our speakers, uh, again, for being here. Um, so, so we'll, we'll call the day. Thank you so much. That was good. That was a, that was a great. Start.